In the previous video, we looked at the surprising fact that outside of a spherical shell of mass, objects experience exactly the same gravity as if all that mass were concentrated at the shell's center point. Because of how area increases with distance squared, while gravity, on the other hand, weakens with distance squared, a special cancellation happens that makes the gravitational field in this case, and in this case, identical. The question now is, what's gravity like inside the shell? Would you believe zero? And not just at the exact center, but really everywhere inside? Well, after the surprising result for gravity outside the shell, maybe this isn't so shocking. But it's true, if we hollowed out the Earth, for example, and you went just underneath the surface, you'd suddenly be free-floating. And if you pushed off a wall, you'd just go in a straight line at constant speed until you bumped into another one. Proving what happens inside the shell actually turns out to be easier, I think, than for outside, and we can even reuse some of the same geometrical ideas. To warm up, and to get a feel for where this argument is going, we'll start with the easiest case first, which is, what is g at the center? Let's start by extending out a very thin imaginary cone toward the surface, with its vertex fixed at p, and think about the gravitational pull coming from the small mass piece where it intersects the shell. Then send out another little cone, exactly the same but in the opposite direction. Because of the spherical symmetry, its intersection with the shell will be another little piece of the mass that's the same size and the same distance away, but pulling in the opposite direction. Like a tug of war that's perfectly balanced, these two forces exactly cancel out. But the whole shell itself is made up of pairs of mass pieces like this. So for any direction you pick, the vector pointing that way has a unique partner that perfectly cancels it out. Meaning g at the center has to be zero. For points not at the center, we can actually play a very similar game. Trying to do a bit of perspective here, suppose we're asking about some random other point inside the shell. We start by thinking about one of the planes that intersects the shell both through p and the center point. Then draw an arbitrary line that lies in the plane but passes through p. To get a clearer view, we can always just look down from above. And then tilt our heads to straighten things up a bit. We don't need to do this for mathematical reasons, it just makes it easier for me to show what's going on. So the plan is to do the same thing as when p was at the center, which is to prove that the gravitational attraction produced by little mass pieces on opposite points of any line through p cancel out in pairs. It doesn't seem obvious anymore that this should happen, since the distances to the shell in each direction aren't the same anymore, and the areas that our cones make when they intersect the shell are different too. But let's work it out. First, we need to remember some facts about cones. If you slice a cone with a plane parallel to its base, where they intersect is an area that's the same shape as the base, only smaller. If we cut the cone instead with a plane closer to the vertex, we get another area that's smaller still. But the two cones made by the vertex with those two different heights are similar, in the precise mathematical sense. And because they have the same vertex angle, their base areas are proportional to their squared heights by the same factor, which I'm calling omega. I'm thinking of this as a 2D or solid angle like from the previous video, and since we're thinking of these cones as being very thin, we can get away with drawing the bases as just flat circles, when they're really sections of a curved sphere. Either way though, the point is that the cross-sectional area, wherever it is, divided by its squared distance to the vertex, is constant. I've also been thinking of the original cone as having a circular base, but it actually doesn't even matter what shape it is. It could be weird and wiggly like this, and the equation still holds. Let's stick with circles though, since they look nicer. What's also nice is that this equation is still true even if we tilt the cutting planes, as long as we tilt them both by the same angle. These new areas are related to their untilted versions by cosine of theta, but that's just a detail. What really matters is that the ratio is still a constant, whatever number that happens to be. This is what we needed, so we'll just keep it over here for later. Back to our spherical shell, Notice how these two angles are the same. 
And if we imagine flipping M1 over to the other side, hopefully this makes it clear that we're in the same situation here as with the similar cones. M1 and M2 are just the masses contained in the two areas where a plane sliced a cone in two different places. Alright, we have everything now, so let's just write down the gravitational fields explicitly. Starting with M1 at a distance r1, here's the expression for the magnitude of the gravitational field at p caused by M1. For M2, we use the same formula, just swap out 1s for 2s. I'm only writing the magnitudes here since we already know what directions the vectors are pointing. Dividing the two equations, the gravitational constant cancels out straight away. And what else can we say about the mass? Well, since by assumption our shell is uniform, that means it has a characteristic surface density. Let's call it sigma. This is just a constant describing the surface material, and has units like kilograms per square meter, for example. So if we want to convert some area on the sphere into the mass it contains, we just multiply the area by sigma. Let's plug this in so we can work in terms of areas instead of masses. And there go the sigmas. So we're left with areas divided by distances squared. But hang on, we can use our relation from earlier and replace both of these by the same constant. Which of course then cancel out. And we're left with the fact that g1 and g2 must have exactly the same magnitude. And so just like when p was at the center, the two vectors cancel. Remember, we didn't choose p as some special point, and the line we drew through it wasn't special either. So the same conclusion holds for all the lines passing through p. It also doesn't matter where p is along the line, or which plane through p in the center point we happen to be looking at. In other words, regardless of where p is inside the sphere, the field produced by mass pieces in all directions cancels out. The gravitational field decreases with distance squared, while the mass increases with distance squared. And the net result is zero. That's it. I want to end with one extension of this idea. Maybe you've thought of some others yourself. It's that even though the proof was for a single thin shell, it can be as thick as you like and nothing changes inside. That's just because one thick shell is the same as a bunch of thin shells stacked together. And the same argument holds for each one. Another point I should emphasize is that I'm not saying that just because you're inside a spherical shell, you'll never feel any gravitational force. It's just that the net force due to the shell itself is zero on the inside. Another mass outside the shell produces its own field that will still pull on you. There's no force shielding from gravity. I should maybe also emphasize that this result is special and only works because of our spherical setup another non-spherical shell will certainly have a non-zero gravitational field inside. The symmetry was crucial for the proof, along with the fact that gravity is an inverse square law. Speaking of which, as some of you have pointed out, there are analogs everywhere here to electrical forces. If we exchange mass for electric charge, and think instead of a uniformly charged shell, the net electric field inside is zero for exactly the same reasons. And for that matter, the field outside is also the same as if all the charge were at the center. Unlike mass though, since charge can be positive or negative, the two forces have some interesting differences. But maybe I'll leave that for a future video. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching.